Hi, everybody. Welcome to our June lightning talks. Uh, we have a set of lightning talks prepared for you today, which I think is a nice blend of technical and non-technical. Um, reminder of our ground rules. So generally, our presenters have around five minutes to present their topic or demo. People will probably go over a little bit. That happens every time. Um, questions and comments, uh, try to uh, keep to the thread in the lightning talk Google chat space. So I've already created one for the first one. And as we go to our next lightning talks, I'll create another thread for each talk. And so if you have questions, comments, feedback, uh, please uh, go ahead and do it in there. And then the presenter after their talk will go into their particular thread, answer things, et cetera. Um, we are recording this meeting uh, just so everybody knows. So what do we have for you today? We have intro to database indexing by Debbie. We have high performing agile teams from Joe about embeddings from Jan and records and tuples in JavaScript by myself. So without further ado, we'll get right into it with Debbie. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Hi everyone, I'm going to share my screen. Got it, we see it Debbie. Okay. All right, and I'm going to talk about database indexing today. Uh, hold on, let me bring up the, my author's view of my PowerPoint. There we go. Um, so database indexing is a complex topic and I'm going to talk about it for five minutes. So I'm going to do a, a brief introduction I already put a couple of reference materials into the chat and database indexing is really both an art and a science. Um, you could spend your whole technical career as a database administrator and handle, handle indexing as a main part of your job. Why do we use database indexes? To improve performance, that's the entire reason. Um, data in a relational data in a relational database is not necessarily stored in a particular order. Um, data is typically stored in something called heap tables, where records are inserted until it fills up a block of memory and then it moves on to the next block of memory. Inserts are quick, but retrieval is inefficient. So we use these things called database indexes, and they are actually separate data structures that allow us to find information quickly. Um, these data structures are usually some type of binary tree structure or a hash index. Um, for those of you who remember studying about different searching algorithms, a binary search Algorithm essentially lets you decide, you, you take the middle value. If you were searching for 100,000 records, you would look at fit, record 50,000 and say, hey, uh, is this too, is the value in here too big or too low? And then cut it in half and you keep cutting your list in half um, so that on average, if you're searching for 100,000 records um, linearly, just going through the whole list, that's going to give you, it's going to take you about 50,000. And a binary search algorithm will take you 16.6 .6 retrievals. Huge difference. So for a telephone book example, in a relational database, we always have some type of primary key, uh, a unique value for each record. It is typically not real life data at all. It's just a sequential number or a, a random generated number. We cannot have a unique key in a telephone book on last name or even first name and last name because we'll have duplicates. We cannot have a unique key on phone numbers because sometimes family members share the same phone number. So in a phone book with a gazillion entries, 
it'll take a very long time to look up a phone number. Some considerations for deciding how to create your database indexes. Indexes are created automatically for primary keys and unique keys, so you don't need to worry about them. A checklist of items that you want to think about. Does your table have a lot of data? It's probably not worthwhile to add indexes for a small table. Are there fields that you search very frequently? That's your checklist for, yes, I have a big table and I want to search on some fields frequently that are not my primary key. And does the column that you want to search on have many values? For example, if you have a gender column and values are male, female, and probably should include other, but that's only three values. So we're dividing your 100,000 records into three distinct values. You're not going to get as much bang for your buck out of an index as, for example, putting an index on street address, where you've got many, many different street address or different street names. There's a lot of other information to consider when using indexes, many different types of indexes. I wanted to just briefly talk about clustered index versus non-clustered index. Um, a clustered index actually orders the data in your table. Typically it's the primary key, but it doesn't have to be a primary key. If you have a clustered index, you're going to get very quick retrievals for ranges of, for large ranges of data. All the other indexes that you add are non clustered index, and they are useful for getting a smaller set of data, particularly if there's many different values on that column. Um, there's many other kinds of indexes. Please refer to my references that I put in the in the uh, Lightning Talk chat. I, I thought that particular, there's many references about database indexing, but I thought the ones that I posted there were very readable. Um, and just keep in mind that each database has its own implementation and has its own set of different types of indexes. So whatever database you're working with, SQL Server or Postgres or MySQL, um, make sure that you're reading the right information for that particular database engine. So this all sounds great. Why don't we just make in indexes for every column on every database table? Well, unfortunately, there is a disadvantage. The um, table, the Indexes themselves are, are a data structure, an extra data structure. They take up storage space and memory. Um, also, indexes make retrieving data faster, but they slow down when you insert, up to, update, or delete, because not only does the data need to be updated, but the index needs to be updated. And that's it for my Lightning Talk presentation. Thanks, Debbie. Appreciate it. That was great. Uh, they're all clapping for you in the other room. I could hear it, but you can't hear it. <laughs> uh, let's uh, now shift over to Joe. All right. Should be able to see my presentation? Yes, we can. All right. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, high performing Agile teams. Um, so if you're dealing with a uh, with an Agile team that has a refined product backlog um, that has uh, items that have currently been ranked, um, the priority matters for those items. Um, we were dealing with a, with a uh, product that had a very refined product backlog. And at the end of the sprint, we were, we were getting plenty of work done, but our product owner was coming back and we weren't getting the highest priority work done for that, for that particular task. Um, so, 
I'm just going to provide a different mindset that, you, that agile teams could do to increase performance of their team. Um, I will preface this by saying I'm intentionally using large numbers um, and exact numbers for demonstration. But typically, if you have a product backlog and your estimates are in the 160 range, you probably want to go back and break those down into smaller pieces. But for this talk, I'm going to use some large numbers just to help demonstrate you know, what I'm talking about. So if we have a product backlog and the top five items in that backlog um, are currently, we have the top three that are estimate 160, the fourth one's an estimate of 40, and the fifth one's estimate of 16. The typical way that an Agile team works is you go down the list and one engineer will take priority one, the next engineer will take priority two, and you kind of work down where you've assigned one task per person. So if we have week-long sprints for this particular team, uh, engineer took priority one, engineer one took priority one, and by the end of that five-week sprint, He's focused on that. It took 170 in the end. So in five weeks, he spent, you know, 40 hours a week for those first four sprints, 10 on that last sprint, and finally delivered that. Engineer two, same way, took that 160. That one actually took exactly what was estimated to the end of four weeks. Um, you know, uh, engineer two has completed priority two. And then engineer three took priority three, which is only 40. Um, it took 35. He completed that. You know, priority four was completed by engineer three the week after because he had time to take the next item, et cetera. So um, at the end of that five-week period, you know, you're getting many of the lower priorities done earlier because of the smaller estimates. Um, and, and working this way also has some built-in cons. Uh, the lower priority works finishing first, which I already talked about, and you're developing individual knowledge or silos uh, within the Agile team. So taking that same sprint and, and working more in a high-performing high team uh, concept, you take the, each priority and you break that down. So if we did have these estimates, now we've taken that first task at 160 and we thought, all right, well, what pieces really make up this 160? So, you know, we might have a database piece in there and we thought, all right, creating the database structure for that might take about 40. Um, we also have some UI that engineer two could take and they could, you know, spend that same time on that. And engineer three could create some backend functions. So we have all three engineers working on that priority one. We've taken that we broke it into pieces that can be accomplished by individuals, but all working towards that same priority uh, when priority matters for that team. You know, taking those things, those, those same tasks, now you can see with the whole team working on priority one, we're delivering priority one in week two. Uh, priority two has begun work in, in week two, and then we're delivering that in week three. So you can see that in that same, you know, same using the same hours, same work, we're now completing those higher priority items sooner you know, as a team. And then there's built-in advantages to that. So we are, as I demonstrated, highest priority is finishing work. We have the opportunity to release earlier based on those features. And there's built-in cross-training and knowledge share, uh, design support and collaboration. So the team's learning together. Uh, we're both developing that function together as if, if I'm working on the UI and you're working on the database, as we get together, I can see the tables you've worked on. We're using the function. So there's built-in you know, knowledge share right within. And again, we're delivering those options faster. I think I talked really fast and I think I went under five minutes, <laughs> but that's the concept. <laughs> great. Yeah. You, you, you caught up for us. That's great. Joe. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Appreciate the, uh, the, the talk there. Very interesting. Um, we'll move on to Jan at this point. Hey, sorry. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes. yes. All right, great. So I want to talk to you about embeddings today. Um, and we're going to go over what are word embeddings, uh, how to create those embeddings, and uh, beyond word embeddings. So let's uh, take a look at word embeddings. What are those? Um, so word embeddings are vectors where each word gets assigned a vector, and the vector is chosen in a way that their position in the vector space says something about their relation to other words. So in this example down here, we see a two-dimensional vector space, so to speak. Um, each word has a two-dimensional vector, and um, similar words are close together, like uh, man, woman, girl, boy, uh, nice, cool, exciting, amazing, awesome. Um, and um, well, why is this uh, important? Like uh, here on the right side, we see uh, the architecture of GPT or ChatGPT, um, where the first uh, layer here is your input will first convert be, be converted into into vectors. So this is 
where vectors are actually used. Um, now, how do we create those uh, vectors or embeddings? Uh, here's a little example. We have um, three sentences here. This is a green car, this is a red car, and this is a green bike. Um, and what we do with these um, oops, uh, uh, sentences is we create a so-called co-occurrence matrix where we, for each two distinct pairs of words, we count the number of sentences that these words appear in. So for example, car and this, uh, the word car and this appears in two of these sentences in the first two, or green and uh, A, for example, right, appear also in two different sentences. Um, so this is the co-occurrence matrix. And then we can take each row of this co-occurrence matrix as a vector for this particular word. So this is the vector for the word car. Um, if we do that, and just focus like on, on four different uh, vectors right now. For a second here, the vector car, bike, green, and red. And we want to paint those vectors. We will do that in a three-dimensional uh, space. So we're going to concentrate on just three dimensions of these vectors and paint them. Uh, to make a point here, we can see that um, the vector for the word car and the vector for the word bike, they have like about an angle of 45 degrees between them. Whereas the vector for the word bike and green, they have uh, about a 90 degree uh, angle between them. And uh, this vector here, green and red, uh, are the same, sorry, the same vectors in this uh, three dimensional cutout here. Green and red, you can see here, are the same. So between green and red, there's actually uh, an angle of zero degrees. And um, what that means is uh, actually the smaller the angle between uh, two vectors or two words, uh, the more they relate to each other. So green and red uh, are very related, car and bike a little bit, and bike and green, not at all. And um, we can express that also differently by saying, okay, uh, if the angle is small, then the cosine of the angle is actually big. So that means that the cosine, uh, whenever the cosine of an angle is big, then the words are uh, closer together or uh, are more similar than when the angle of the cosine gets smaller. And uh, the cosine of, of the angle, we can quickly uh, or like easily uh, calculate with, uh, with the dot product here. Um, so we uh, take the dot product divided by the, uh, by the product of the uh, magnitudes of those two vectors. This is the calculation here. And if we do that, we can uh, calculate this so-called cosine similarity uh, of red and green, for example, we said the angle was zero. So uh, the cosine of zero is one. Uh, so this is uh, what, what comes here as super similar. One is like the most similar you can get. Whereas a bike and red, the angle was 90 degrees. So the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So they are uh, not related at all. And then we have bike and car here. If you remember, uh, they had like about 45 degrees uh, of an angle. The cosine of that is 0.70. Um, so this is uh, um, how to cal uh, calculate the similarity of two uh, vectors. We can do that now and say like for any given word, like say car, for example, we create the similarity to, to each of these other words from our corpus that we had and like um, write them out uh, in a decremental order here. So that uh, they will say like the uh, most similar to the vector word car is the word bike in our seven dimensional space now, not the, not the three dimension that we look at, but in the, in the complete space, right? Or we can say what's the most similar to green, um, right, would be uh, red, right? So um, this is how we create, uh, you know, vector, uh, word vector embeddings. And we can uh, go beyond word vectors and uh, take any uh, thing that has like a, collection of like words, uh, like in this case here, we have um, the Twitter followers, user one follows these three Twitter handles here, user two follows these three Twitter handles and user three follows these three Twitter handles. We can create the same, uh, use the same methodology um, and um, create vectors for all these items. And uh, by the end, we can see how oh, the most similar for Donald Trump is uh, Barack Obama in this set. Um, we can, uh, in another case here, we once had uh, you know, browsing data for a million people throughout like three years. Uh, so user one on day one goes first to Gmail, then goes to Wells Fargo, then goes to CNN, 
user two on day one goes to Gmail with Fargo and Fox and so on and so forth. You do the same uh, methodology here and you'll get like similar uh, websites. So what's similar to Outlook? Gmail, right? Um, and uh, there's another uh, example where we have like a Spotify's playlist. So um, a million, uh, Spotify put out this data set where they uh, make public like a million playlists, random playlists. And you know, user one has this playlist where they listen to these the song, uh, to these artists here. User two listens to this uh, artist in one playlist and user three to these. And then you can get like, uh, you know, artist similarities. What's the most similar artist in this little toy data set here only for Queen? Well, it would be uh, this Bob Dylan. Now, um, this is uh, a very uh, crude way to do, or like a very uh, quick way to do these word vectors. There are better ways. Uh, instead of the counting, you can use something called the smooth positive pointwise mutual information, which is kind of a statistically, uh, like there are some statistics in the uh, in the counting, uh, and then you can reduce the, sorry, the, reduce the overall dimensionality of those vectors. Um, and um, that uh, all is encapsulated in this uh, algorithm called word to vec that was made famous uh, like in 2013 or so. And you can do the, uh, like use the same data, just uh, run it through word to vec you get like a similar, uh, similar uh, result here. And um, I just uh, ran the entire data set of this uh, Spotify playlist through word to vec uh, and plotted the vectors in a two-dimensional space here. Uh, and that uh, gives you nice clusters of like uh, music uh, types, music, uh, music genres, I guess, uh, you know, a, a map of music genres and artists. That's what you get. When you, when you use that on other data, other data. Yep, that's it. That's cool. I'm just looking at your graph right now. Very interesting. Thank you, Jan. Awesome. Sure. All right, let me get mine set up. I am last here. Let me share my screen. Everybody can just let me know when they can see it. Can anybody give me confirmation you can we see can, my... We can see it, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right. So my talk is on records and tuples in JavaScript. Uh, this is a somewhat more on the technical side, though maybe not as technical as Jan's just was. Uh, and it deals with JavaScript. So hopefully I didn't just lose about 75% of the audience. Let me go to my next slide. So here's a quick overview. So what is a record? Uh, a record is an immutable object. And a tuple is an immutable array in JavaScript. This is their naming for the proposed update. Uh, we know that records and tuples have different meanings in different environments like databases or other languages, same with tuples. But in JavaScript, in this proposal to the JavaScript language, a record is an immutable object and a tuple is an immutable array. As I mentioned, this is a proposed update. It's not available in browsers yet. You can't go to your console in Chrome and play around with records and tuples. It's currently in stage two out of four uh, for the proposal. So it means the committee expects the feature to be developed and eventually included in the standard. So just some quick JavaScript info for people who aren't as familiar with JavaScript. You're gonna see triple equals in some of the code samples here. That's just a test for equality. Uh, and you're gonna see some keywords, let and const that's used for declaring changeable and unchangeable variables in the newer version of JavaScript. And I, I try to use that properly where I, where I can. So let's get into it. So, let, so in JavaScript, we have strings and we have objects. Uh, we have more types than that, but let's talk about strings and objects. Strings are immutable. Objects are mutable. Meaning, uh, if we look at equality for a string, if I compare Jeff equal to Jeff, I'm going to get true back. But if I compare two objects, for example, an object with a property of prop being one to another proper, another object with a property of one, I'm actually going to get false. That's because for objects, uh, the uh, uh, it evaluates equality using the object's ID, the actual object ID, not the actual values of the object. In addition, when I'm passing around a string, for example, in the bottom, I uh, create a string called car and I pass that string to a change string function. I'm guaranteed when I come back to my scope that my string is still going to be car. 
String is immutable, it can't be changed. For an object though, if I have a change object function, uh, because I'm passing by reference that object, the underlying function can actually change the object I pass into it. And so when I come back to my scope, my object might have a property of 10 or 100 or 1,000. You just don't know. There's no guarantee there. So if you know JavaScript pretty well, you know that we can freeze objects with a, a function called to object.freeze. But freezing an object is a shallow action. It only freezes or makes immutable the top level properties of an object. So I have an example here. If I've got an object that has a vehicle property and inside the vehicle property is another object with the property type and car, and I freeze the OBJ object, I still can change the underlying type of the vehicle object inside that object. Sorry, I'm using the word object a lot. So if I log the object vehicle, I'm now going to get type boat. In other words, freezing is not deep a deeply immutable action on a, a, uh, an object. Another potential issue with using objects in JavaScript, and again, these are all potential issues. There's values to the decisions that were made with objects, and there are potential issues. Another potential issue is using objects as keys in a map. So if you have a map with key value pairs, uh, I have an example here of a, some with coordinates and then the location on the map of those coordinates, latitude and longitude. And you'll notice uh, I create a Chantilly coordinates object with latitude 39, longitude 77, and I set that into my map. Well, if I go and do a get from my map using the actual object, Chantilly coordinates, I'll get back the string Chantilly. But if I use an object with the same values, latitude 39, longitude 77, because of that equality of identity equality, I will get back undefined from my map. So now we have records and tuples that will solve most of the problems that I've discussed. So let's talk about syntax first. The proposal uh, de declares that to declare a record, you use that hash syntax. So it's creating an object with a, a hash character in front of it, creating a tuple with a hash character in front of it. So note that hash character in front. Those will create records and tuples. Now, when we talk about some details, records and tuples inside of them can contain other records and tuples but you can't put an object or a function inside a record or a tuple. So they kind of have to be consistent here for some of the features of these types. So let's talk about uh, records and tuples in terms of mutability and immutability. There is deep immutability in a record and a tuple. So I have some coding examples here. If I create a record with a prop of one, if I try to change the prop, I'm going to get a type error. Uh, if I create a second record that has that same vehicle and type example I gave earlier, if I try to change the vehicle type, in other words, uh, change it to boat, I'm going to get a type error. It's deeply immutable. Similarly for a tuple, if I try to change the tuple uh, in uh, element zero to 77, I'll get a type error. If I try to push something new to a tuple, I'm just going to get it's not a function. There's no push function on a tuple. You can't change it. Uh, you get value equality with records and tuples, not identity equality. So if I declare a record with prop one and I ask if record is equal to another record with a prop one, I'm going to get true, okay? That becomes important uh, later when we talk about objects and keys in a map. So we also now have solved our problem of not being able to change a record in a function call. So if I have a record that's got a prop of one and I call a change record function, it's going to throw a type error because the record cannot be changed. And so I'm guaranteed when I come back to that scope that my record still has that value with prop of one. In addition, there is a quality regardless of attribute order. So I have two vehicles defined here. Both have the same, if you notice, attributes and values. You'll also notice that there's an owner record inside of the record here. So car named Kit with the owner of Knight. If I compare these two vehicles, I'm going to get uh, true. And as I mentioned, now we can use a record as a map key. And you'll notice I have that same example, but now at the bottom, I can use another record that I declare with the same latitude and longitude to retrieve Chantilly or Cincinnati. 
Lastly, here are some helpful links. Uh, I, there's a very good introductory presentation on records and tuples by one of the, uh, the gentlemen that helped put to together the proposal. Uh, if you want to review it, it's about 25, 30 minutes long. They go into much more, he goes into much more detail. It's where I got a lot of my uh, information for this talk. There's also a playground. So if you go to this site, uh, you can actually play around with records and tuples. It gives you a small JavaScript REPL where you can declare records, tuples, play around and, and see how this all works. And then there's a more detailed description. They call it a tutorial. I would just call it a more detailed description of the proposal for records and tuples. That's my talk. Hopefully I kind of piqued your interest in upcoming uh, feature of the JavaScript language of records and tuples. And that is the end of our, I'm going to stop sharing if I can figure that out. Okay, so that's the end of our lightning talk session for this month. Thank you to Debbie and Jan and Joe for presenting. Again, there are now threads in the lightning talk space. If you'd like to continue the discussion there, I will post and I would encourage other presenters to post a copy of their presentation in their corresponding thread so you can get to any links that we uh, created there. Thanks for attending. If you're interested to give an upcoming, if you're interested in giving a lightning talk in an upcoming session of these, please just reach out to me. We'll figure out a time for the next one once we can figure out some presenters. Again, the bar is low. We're trying to get people to uh, to share, to share knowledge and collaborate and share what they read in blog posts or tweets, et cetera, that they see as new that others might find interesting. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day and a great weekend. Thank you.